And today, as we give this talk, it is, of course, Easter Sunday. And under normal circumstances, many people would have attended church services where the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the rising from the dead of Jesus Christ, would have been celebrated. Uh, hence the title of our talk today, The Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is it a fact? Did it really happen? Or is it fiction? And in order to try and answer this question, we're going to pose three more questions and answer those. Firstly, if we look in at whether Jesus rose from the dead, I suppose, first of all, we have to establish if he was a real person. For him to rise from the dead, he must have lived and died. So was Jesus an actual historical figure? Assuming that we decide he was, we're then going to ask the question, well, maybe Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Maybe the story of his resurrection is in fact fiction. And assuming that we decide that it is a fact, then we'll ask the question, well, why does it matter to us? It's something that happened 2000 years ago. What relevance does it have to us today? So the first of our questions then, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, did Jesus really exist? Is he simply a myth that we read of in the Bible that Christians perpetuate? Or is Jesus Christ actually a historically documented person? So what do the history books have to say about Jesus then? Uh, well, this is a, a rather stylized picture of the historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus. He was a Roman Jewish historian. He lived from AD 37 until around about AD 100. Uh, so we can see from that that he's, he's not quite a contemporary of Jesus, but he was born just after the, um, the death of Jesus. If we say for argument's sake that Jesus, um, well, we're told that his ministry began when he was 30 years old and it lasted three years. So if we say his ministry was from approximately, give or take, AD 30 to 33. So Josephus was born just after the death of Jesus. Uh, so it's a fairly recent thing for him in history. He was a Jew because he was born in Jerusalem. He was actually the head of the armed forces in Galilee during the first Jewish-Roman War of AD 67, uh, but he surrendered to Rome in that, in that war. So that's why he ended up as a, a Roman. Uh, he was given the freedom, he was given his freedom in Rome and he became a Roman citizen. Uh, and he is one of the earliest uh, reliable historians that we have. Having said that, uh, this first uh, quote that we have up on screen now, there is a little bit of uh, contentiousness in it because it seems that it was amended a little bit by a Jewish scribe, sorry, by a Christian scribe at some stage, believed to be possibly the third or fourth century. Um, so the bit saying that Jesus was a good man and virtuous is not believed to be in the, in the original from Josephus, but everything else there pretty much was. So everything we've got in black is based on what Josephus actually recorded. So he says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and many people from among the Jews and many nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. So that's from his Antiquities of the Jew, book 18. Uh, and later on in book 20 of his Antiquities of the Jews, uh, this is uh, accepted by scholars to be genuine, completely genuine, he reports on the, um, the brother of Jesus. Um, there was a Sanhedrin of judges assembled and brought before him was the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. Another historical figure here, uh, a statue of the historian Tacitus, Publius Cornelius Tacitus. He is reckoned to have been one of the greatest Roman historians he lived a little bit after Josephus, approximately AD 56 to 120. But again, Jesus was fairly recent history to him, as recent to him perhaps, perhaps more recent than the Second World War is to us, for example. He was a Roman senator, and this was what he reported. He said, are you speaking about the fire of Rome that Nero blamed on the Christians? Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, 
called Christians by the populace. Christus, which is the Latin form of the name Christ. Uh, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. And uh, he was not biased. He was not a, a Jew. He was not a Christian. And in fact, you can see he wasn't biased because he describes Christianity as being a most mischievous superstition. Uh, another, not a historian actually, but a politician, a uh, Roman politician. Uh, this is the best picture I could find actually in the public domain of uh, Pliny the Younger. He lived similar time to uh, Tacitus, AD 61 approximately to AD 113. He was a Roman senator. He was actually the governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor. He was also an imperial magistrate under the emperor Trajan. And the quote we're going to put up was actually from a letter he wrote to Trajan asking how, um, how he should conduct legal proceedings against those accused of Christianity. So uh, again, he wasn't um, a Christian by any means. His report is unbiased towards them. And he reports that these Christians were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. And that's perhaps mentioned because uh, some people had uh, ritual cannibalism and that kind of thing in those days. So taking of bread and wine was quite an ordinary thing, ordinary thing to do. So what are we seeing then from the historians? Well, historians from only just after the time of Jesus Christ have reported that he had many disciples, that he had a brother called James. Josephus tells us these things. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Uh, both Josephus and Tacitus tell us that. Tacitus also tells us it was during the reign of the emperor Tiberius. And uh, Pliny the Younger reports that his followers gathered together and they sang hymns they try to live a virtuous life and there is an allusion to the memorial service there as well. So all these things are things that agree with the Bible record uh, and they tell us that Jesus Christ really was a historical figure. Whether you believe he was the son of God, whether you believe he was raised from the dead is another matter, but you have to accept the fact that Jesus was a real person who really did live at the time the Bible tells us of. So, our answer to that is, yes, Jesus did really exist. He was a real person. Well, that's one thing. Whether he rose from the dead is another thing, isn't it? Just because he existed doesn't mean that the story of his resurrection is a true story. Maybe Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Maybe it is actually a work of fiction. So how could that be then? How could it be that there is the story of his resurrection if it didn't actually happen. Well, one idea is that the body, the dead body of Jesus, was moved by the disciples and they then claimed because there was no body that Jesus was risen. Well, the problem is with this immediately is that the Bible tells us that a guard was set at the tomb where Jesus' body was in order to guard against this very thing happening. Uh, Matthew 27, starting at verse 64, the chief priests and the Pharisees come to Pilate and they say, command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate tells them to do that, and in verse 66 they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So the chief priests and the Pharisees were aware of this as a possibility. They knew Jesus had said that uh, he would only be dead for three days. And so they say we need to guard against the disciples trying to make that come true in their eyes. And so they guard the tomb, they seal the stone, they set a watch in order to make sure the disciples cannot steal the body. So for the disciples to steal the body, they would have had to overcome the guards in order to do that. And there is no record of that happening. 
you also have the fact that the disciples didn't expect Jesus to rise from the dead. They were disheartened. They were confused. They were afraid. As all they knew was that Jesus was dead. They believed all that, that all was lost. And they were not even thinking about Jesus Christ rising from the dead. Uh, never mind start to concoct some story and some plan so that they can put that rumour around. You've also got the fact that uh, the early chapters of Acts tell us of the early church after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, that the chapters there tell us of the huge expansion, the rapid expansion of the gospel message. For that to happen, they must have been absolutely convinced of what they were preaching. How could they have preached so effectively about something that, in actual fact, they all knew was a lie? You've also got the question, well, why would they do that? Why would they preach about a lie when what they actually faced very often was ridicule for coming up with this story about a man who'd been raised from the dead? They, first, they faced persecution. The authorities trying to stamp out the Christian movement and the gospel message. And they even faced death for what they preached. Why would they do that if they actually knew that what they were preaching was a lie? And you've got the fact that if the body was moved by the disciples, that means that the body was somewhere. There is no record of any search being made for a body, never mind a body being found. All they had to do was find the body of Jesus the, and the story of his resurrection would have been nipped in the bud. And you've also got the fact that nobody ever deviated from what they said. All those who were involved were very consistent in their message and in what they said happened. If they were all actually lying, you'd expect at some stage, at least for one of them, to have had a fit of conscience and to have admitted that actually it was all a lie. But that never happened. There is no report of that ever happening. You've got the possibility as well that maybe it was all innocent, that the body was moved quite innocently and... It was then a misunderstanding, the fact that there was nobody. It is suggested that maybe Joseph of Arimathea, who owned the tomb, that, that he moved Jesus' body into a different tomb. But you'd have to ask the question, well, why would he do that? He'd volunteered the tomb that Jesus' body was put in because it was available. And again, you've got that fact that nobody was produced. If it was a misunderstanding, then the tomb with the body of Jesus was somewhere. You only need somebody to reduce the body. And again, the story of Jesus' resurrection would be nicked in the bud. It is suggested that maybe the Jewish or Roman authorities moved the body. You've got the same question. Why would they do that? They would have no particular interest in the dead body of Jesus Christ. And if they had moved it, then again, the body of Jesus Christ was somewhere available. They could have produced it and they would have produced it in order to stop these stories about Jesus being raised from the dead. But once again, nobody was ever produced. There used to be a suggestion, it's not particularly popular these days, but there used to be a suggestion popular in the early 19th century that, that maybe D D Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, that he swooned, that he lost consciousness, something like that, and that he actually revived in the tomb. <clears throat> well, the Bible tells us that the Roman soldiers knew that Jesus was dead. Reading from John chapter 19, starting at verse 33. So the soldiers have been to the two that were crucified with Jesus and they broke their legs so that they could no longer support their, bo their body weight, which is how they were able to stay alive. Once that you can't support your body weight when crucified, you die very quickly after that. So they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already. So they break not his legs, but they decided to make sure anyway. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So the Roman soldiers looked at Jesus, and they knew that he was dead. They also thrust a spear into his side to check. You have the fact that Jesus suffered massive blood loss on the cross itself when his hands and feet were nailed to it. From his side, when the spear was thrust in, from his back and his head during his trial when he was scourged and 
and the crown of thorns was placed on his head. It wasn't done gently so as not to cause him too much discomfort. It was designed to be painful. It was designed to cause as much damage as they could. So again, there would be massive blood loss from there. And the idea that he would have revived in the cool of the tomb doesn't actually work for a Mediterranean climate. The cool of the tomb would actually finish somebody off rather than um, allowing them to revive. And you've also got the fact that he could probably survive without food for three days in the tomb, but he would be unlikely to survive without water. And even if he did, he would have to get himself out of the grave clothes, which would not have been easy. He would have had to remove the stone from the inside. Remember, it had been sealed. And then, having done that without alerting the guards, which would have been impossible in the first place, he would have somehow had to overcome the guards, being in the half-death state that he was. And if he was able to do all that, he would then have to find the disciples and somehow convince them that, that he, this half-dead figure stood in front of them, had been miraculously raised from the dead. So it seems that that can't be the, the answer to the problem either. There is the suggestion that maybe they actually got the wrong tomb. When they came to the tomb of Jesus, they got mistaken and went to the wrong tomb, and that's why there was no body there. Uh, reading from Mark's Gospel this time, chapter 15, we read in verse 40, there were also women looking on afar off as the body of Jesus was placed in the tomb, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses and Salome. And then in verse 47, we're told, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, beheld where he was laid. And there's a suggestion that, well, they were afar off, so maybe they didn't actually see that closely the exact tomb that Jesus was put in. And when they came back, they got the wrong one. But Verse 47 does seem to be telling us that they saw the exact place where he was laid. They beheld where he was laid. And then the next chapter, Mark 15, uh, sorry, Mark 16, we read at verses 5 and 6 that when the women come back to the sepulchre, entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. And it suggested that, that the young man was a gardener or somebody tending to either the tombs or the grounds. And when he says he is not here, he, he is actually saying this is not the tomb. He is not in this tomb. Behold the place where they laid him. Behold that tomb. That is the tomb where his body is. But of course, to do that, you've got to ignore those three words in the middle there of what the young man, who we believe was actually an angel, of what that young man said. He actually said, didn't he? He is risen so quite clearly he was not saying his body is over there he is saying he is risen he is not here in this tomb where he once was behold the place where they laid him and see that the body is no longer there and if they had gone to the wrong tomb you've also got to fall of course the fact that the right tomb was there somewhere with the body of jesus in it if he had not risen and you can't get away from that fact that you, we keep coming back to this point, don't we? That if the body was not risen, the body was there somewhere. So the right tomb was there somewhere with the body of Jesus in it. And it only took one person to find it in order to, again, to stop this story about the resurrection of Jesus Christ there and then. You've got the fact that Peter and John came to the tomb that they visited the tomb so did they also get the wrong tomb the women got the wrong tomb peter and john got the wrong tomb and what about the guards the guards were gu guarding the correct tomb they wouldn't have got the wrong tomb so and they knew that something had happened at the correct tomb they know that knew that something extraordinary had occurred uh, matthew 28 starting at verse 11 uh, now, when the, I think it's the women there were going, behold, some of the watch, so some of the guards came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And the chief priest gave to the soldiers large sums of money, saying, say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. So you've got the fact that the soldiers knew what had happened. They knew that something extraordinary had happened. They knew the disciples hadn't stolen the body because that is a, a story that they were given large sums of money to start a rumour on. 
and they knew that the body was no longer there. You've also got the final suggestion then that we're going to look at is maybe it was all just a made up story that the disciples made up this story that Jesus was risen from the dead. They knew all along that he wasn't. Well, the thing is with the made up story is you can make up whatever story you want, can't you? And you can make yourself seem as good as you want. If they'd been making up a better, if sorry, if they'd been making up a story, they would have made up a better story than the one they made because the story we have in the gospel record shows them in a bit of a bad light, a bit of a negative light. For example, reading, uh, this is from Luke 24, verse 11, the words of the women who said that they had been to the sepulchre and been told that Jesus was risen, their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulchre where the body of Jesus had been laid. And when he saw that there was no body there, he departed, wandering in himself. And so we're told that they doubted the women's report. We're told that Peter was wondering. Peter didn't understand. He couldn't work out why there was no body there. And later on in verse 17, Jesus joins two disciples and he says to them what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad and they say to him are you a stranger in Jerusalem have you not heard about Jesus who has been crucified that we thought was the saviour but now everything is lost and later on in the chapter at verse 37 we read that Jesus appears to the eleven and some others that were gathered there and they were terrified and affrighted and suppose that they had seen a spirit. And there is also Thomas, who wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples and said, except I can, unless I can see the wounds that he has and, and put my hands in them, I will not believe. That's not the story they'd have made up, is it? If they were going to make up a story, they would have put themselves in a far better light than the gospel record does. They would have said something along the, the lines of, well, we never doubted as soon as Jesus died. We never doubted that he would be raised again. We knew he would rise from the dead because the prophets of all told us that and Jesus himself told us. So the record of the gospel tells us has the ring of truth, doesn't it? And you've also got the eyewitnesses to it that... Um, Paul speaks about in the chapter that we had read for introduction, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting at verse 5, uh, Jesus, after he was risen from the dead, was seen of Cephas, that's Peter. So he was seen of Peter and then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above, of, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. So Peter is making the point here that there are many eyewitnesses. There were many people that had seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, if you doubt it, then you can go and speak to them. Verse 6 is saying that there were 500 brethren at once, more than that. Most of those are still alive. So he's saying you can go and speak to them and you can ask them about this and you will see that they are absolutely convinced of what they saw, that they have seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You can go and ask them. And they will tell you. So we're going to say that Jesus did rise from the dead, that Jesus was a real person and he really did rise from the dead. That is a fact. There is no other conclusion we can come to. We have one more question to answer, don't we? And that is, why does it matter to us? It's 2000 years since these things happened. What difference does it make to us here and now today? Well, the resurrection was a very important part of what the disciples preached, what the apostles went on to preach in the early chapters of the Acts. And in fact, in all the chapters of the Acts. Right in the very first chapter, Acts 1 verse 22, the rest of the apostles have decided that they need a replacement for Judas Iscariot. He was a disciple who had betrayed Jesus to death. And when he realised the enormity of what he'd done, he hanged himself and so they said that we need somebody who 
has been with us throughout the ministry of Jesus, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? So it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that marks him out from everybody else and makes the gospel record and the message of salvation a reality. Acts chapter 4, verse 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So that's the Jewish leaders upset because the resurrection of the dead is being taught by the disciples. And again, it's this resurrection that forms the, the very heart of what they're preaching, the very centre of the message of the hope of salvation. Verse 33 of the same chapter, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And again, Paul speaking to the people of Athens, uh, and they said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And Paul again in chapter 23, verse 6, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And so the centre part of the hope is the resurrection of the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope. And um, earlier in that ch uh, chapter of Acts, verse 31, Paul had said to the men of Athens that God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that man, of course, being Jesus Christ, whereof God hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised Jesus from the dead. So the fact that God has raised Jesus from the dead gives men, can give all those who will respond to it assurance can give them hope and again 1 peter chapter 1 so the words of peter verse 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead so the resurrection of jesus christ can give us a lively hope and so the words of paul once more in first of thessalonians chapter 4 he says, verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those that ha have died, those who are in the sleep of death, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we can have hope that we can also be raised from the dead. And that's what that uh, chapter that we had read for introduction, that's what that is all about. First of Corinthians chapter 15, it's often known as the resurrection chapter, because in it, Paul is countering the, the Greek doctrine of the immortality of the soul. And he says that that is not what God has, uh, what the message of salvation that God offers us. It is through resurrection. And so he says that it is the gospel by which we are saved. So resurrection is the good news by which we can hope to have salvation. And he says there are, there are two big pieces of evidence that Jesus is risen from the dead. The first is that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, as the prophet said. He says twice in those verses, as said the scriptures. So the prophet said that Jesus would rise from the dead. And then he mentions those eyewitnesses that we've also that we've already referred to. So they are evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead. And then he says that it is important to us because we can be raised from the dead because Jesus was raised from the dead. We need Jesus to have been raised so that we can have hope of salvation ourselves through his resurrection. He says, if there is no resurrection, if Jesus is not raised, then nobody will be raised and there is no hope for salvation. But happily, he concludes that Christ is risen from the dead. And so we too can be risen through him when he returns to this earth to set up God's kingdom. So. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, we need to answer the question, don't we? Is it fact or is it fiction? It is a fact. 
Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. We have no doubt of that. It is a fact. And in doing so, he has defeated death. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we too can be raised from the dead. We can have hope of salvation. We can have immortality through Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, by taking on his saving name in baptism and by doing our best then to follow his ways, following those ways that God has revealed for us in his word, the Bible. And that salvation will be in the coming kingdom of God at a time when there will be eventually no wickedness, no sorrow, no suffering. Even death itself will be done away with, that chapter in Corinthians told us. There will be no famine, no pollution, no pestilence, no coronavirus, no war. But instead, the world will be filled with the glory of God. And so in conclusion, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is the first and greatest of many men and women who have done their best to follow his ways and will also be raised from the dead to die no more. And you and I have the opportunity to share in that time, to share in that glorious resurrection that is to come. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Thank you. Thank you.